Our first speaker today is from Nicaragua. She's our third generation coffee farmer and escaped to Honduras, uh, the civil war in Nicaragua when she was a child, eventually moving to the United States and studying international business. Today, she's going to be talking us and telling us some stories from uh, Nicaragua and uh, coffee producing uh, lands. Please welcome Rina Baguaga. Can everybody hear me? Wonderful. You can't just scream. So I think I met a few of you, but for those of you who I haven't met, welcome to, you know, to, to this presentation. Uh, it's been wonderful meeting everybody from uh, here in Italy, as well as from so many different areas in Europe. This is a wonderful experience, and I'm very lucky to be here, so thank you. So today I want to share with you some stories from origin, specifically Nicaragua, and specifically my family. I want to share with you what challenges that we've faced throughout the years, as well as how we've dealt with them. So let me tell you first a little bit about Nicaragua. How many of you have been to Nicaragua? Wonderful. Yes. Great. So Nicaragua, it's a small uh, country in Central America. It, uh, we have about 6 million uh, in population. And it is bordered by Honduras to the north. And uh, I breathe a lot. Is that better? OK, can you hear me? OK. So to the north, we have Honduras, which I'm sure you've heard of as well, <laughs> and uh, to the south, Costa Rica. So Nicaragua, it's a still a very agricultural product uh, country. We depend a lot on coffee. It's extremely important. It is the main export crop for all of Nicaragua. Roughly 53% of the agricultural jobs are f through coffee. And uh, so when you're buying coffee from Nicaragua, you're helping roughly about 300,000 people and uh, 45,000 families solely depend on coffee as their main income. We grow uh, Arabica coffees, and uh, our yearly production for the whole country is roughly 2 million uh, bags, 100 pound bags. So we are not one of the top 10 producers of coffees. We're still fairly small. Our harvest is from October to April, starting with the lowlands and then going up to the you know, higher elevation coffees uh, farms, which is where we are located. 98% of the farms are still shade grown, and there's different si sizes, small, medium, and you know, to large estates. The main varietals that are produced are Caturra, Catuai, your usual suspects, Bourbon, Pacamara, Maracaturra, Javanica, and then some other new ones. There are three main regions, I'm sure you, you've heard of uh, some of them, but, uh, that grow coffee. Nueva Segovia, which is where we are located, it's in the northern part of Ni Nicaragua, and we actually border Honduras. We produce about 15% of the coffee, so quantity-wise we are not so big, but quality-wise we are. In fact, most of the Cup of Excellence winners from Nicaragua have come from Nueva Segovia. Hinotega and Matagalpa are the other two main regions, and they produce the majority of the coffee. About 80% of the uh, coffee comes from those two regions. And uh, those are usually larger states that we're talking about. Can you hear me? Yeah. So how did I get involved with this? Well, as a little kid. I'm a third generation coffee producer, and that's unfortunately me in the picture. <laughs> Uh, but my dad started uh, when he was a young kid running around. You know, my grandfather had a farm, so he used to help out with the farm. And then he married my mom, and uh, he, really, he started establishing his own farm. And he grew the farms and eventually opened as well a dry mill. So here you see our pictures. That's me, my brother, my dad, my mom. And we used to live in the dry mill. So the patios were our playing grounds. The, we used to pick the, the, you know, the coffee fruit from the trees, and um, we used to help out as much as we could. For, not just for us, but for most of coffee producers in the world, coffee is a family affair. So everybody within the family is involved and helps out as much as they can. So everything was going great for us until the 1980s when Nicaragua was um, hit by the Civil War. It was devastated for the country and for many families, including ours. We had to leave the country in search of safety, 
and we moved to Honduras, where we find a new home. Everything that was my dad and my mom had created, the farms were taken away. So at 61 years old, my dad had to move with his family to a new country and start from scratch. He was able to start a new farm, and uh, we were in Honduras uh, for about 10 years. We lived there, and uh, then in the 1990s, you know, there was something missing. You know, uh, Nicaragua was thankfully go going back to being, you know, in a better situation politically, and uh, there were some people getting back their farms. So my dad decided to give it a, a shot and go back home. So we did. In 1997, we went back to Nicaragua, hoping that we would get back the life that we had before the war. Unfortunately, that did not happen. We moved back to Nicaragua, but the farms that they, uh, we had before were not given back. So my dad, now 72 years old, had to start yet again from scratch, but this time he was home. This is my dad, Don René, and he's 90 years old today. Wow. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. He's my inspiration, and he's the reason I'm here today, able to talk to all of you and share our story. He is sharp as a wit. He's a walking encyclopedia. People around the town go to him and ask for you know, any kind of advice that he can give. His passion for coffee, it's limitless, and it's so contagious. You sit with him, and it's incredible. There's no re you want to own a farm. So <laughs> not necessarily. And this is me and my brother. So we're five siblings, but my brother and I are the ones that are working within in the coffee business, in the family business. This is my brother, Renee, and he manages the farms. And uh, you know, he basically does all of the operations in, in Nicaragua. I'm also there in the Finca Los Congos. And uh, I go during harvest, and I spend all of the time during harvest. But I also um, travel like, to events like this telling our story, because unfortunately not everybody can go and visit us at Origin, so I try to do the best to bring Origin to you. So when we got um, really uh, back to Nicaragua and really trying to build the new farms, there were many challenges that not just us, but any coffee producer around the world faces. The most, um, the main one that I want to talk to you about is the economic risk. Coffee is a long-term commitment. It takes three to five years for the coffee plants to produce their first full yield. In the meantime, throughout that time, you have to maintain the farm, you have to give food to the plants, make sure that they're healthy. We have lots of pests. I'm sure everybody here has heard about roya or coffee rust. It's devastated our, us and our neighbors and everybody in Central America. People have lost 30 to 40 percent of their production just to it. But it's not just rust, there's many other uh, diseases that we have to take care of. So it's a lot of uh, investment that goes into a farm. Then once you finally get that full first year of harvest, one coffee tree only yields approximately one pound of roasted coffee. And continuously, you guys are wanting more great coffee. <laughs> so we continuously have to continue plant a lot, a lot of trees to be able to provide the, the, the demand. Now the main problem that traditional coffee has is that the price is fluctuates all the time. Volat volatility in the price is really, really high. If we look at C price right now, it's 120 per pound. That is not a livable wage. I mean, it doesn't even cover your production costs. So how do we do, you know, what do we do, you know, in order to mitigate that, to get something more value for the amount of work that we're putting into our farms? So in our case, we decided to focus on controlling the qu in quality, basically. And we went ahead and said, OK, we're going to control every step of the way that we can and ensure that we produce the best quality coffee that we can, and to, all the way from the seed to the harvest, to the drying, because we have the dry mill, to cuppings, to the exporting, and all the way through the distribution. How do we do this? So we have two farms, Finca Los Congos and Finca Las Brumas. And some of you might have tried the coffee because one of them is here. And they are in Sa San Fernando, which is Nueva Segovia. We have been blessed with a really great altitude, uh, elevation of 1,350 to 1,600 meters. 
We are roughly about 35 hectares between both farms, so we're medium size. Uh, varietals that we produce are Pacamara mainly, and we also have cat Caturra and VSRG is a new varietal that we are experimenting with. We have light shade from fruit trees and also pine trees. It's a beautiful, it's amazing, <laughs> the view. We have, uh, our harvest is January through April, although this past year went all the way through May because we are the last farms in the whole mountain. We produce usually the, the, the traditional method, which is washed, but we also, a couple of years ago, started producing honeys and natural coffees. We have been very fortunate that those experiments have turned out well. We have participated in Cup of Excellence uh, for about 10 years, and thankfully have been um, in the top three coffees uh, all, all throughout. Our Los Congos got second place in 2011, uh, fifth place last year, and our Las Brumas got sixth place last year, and I think Cafe Pascucci has some of it around. <laughs> We also last year were, and those are with, with our washed coffees. So what we've been doing for many, many years, what we have the most experience with. The tricky question was, okay, what's gonna happen with our naturals and honeys? Well, last year we worked with one of our uh, clients in the US and they submitted our Capacamara Natural and we were um, awarded with a 94 point and one of, rated one of the top 30 coffees by Coffee Review in the United States. So when I showed that to my dad, he was like, okay. <laughs> Very happy. But there's a lot of work that takes into all of that. It doesn't just come easy. So we spend a lot of time in education and training. We work with an agronomist right here that uh, he's from, we've been working with him for eight years with soil analysis on the farms and just making sure that everything that we are putting in, it's actually gonna have a good effect on the farms. We also train the pickers. So we employ anywhere from 30 to 100 pickers a year, seasonal workers and uh, they come back year after year, thankfully, because there's a lot of training. We, we require a lot in order to ensure quality. We, you only pick the ripe red, and there's different shades of red, right? So we make sure that they know exactly the type of red that, that it is. The fruit ripens at different uh, you know, uh, rates, so you usually have to go around the same um, area three times throughout harvest. So if you see here, you see those greens that would leave them on the tree, they would only get the, the the, um, the red ones. Then once they pick them, we have meticulous quality control. What do we mean by that? So a lot of, we make sure that the unripe beans, because it happens, you pick some unripe, it, you know, go right in there, and the overripe are separated. And we process everything separately. We don't combine. So that what you get here, it's really the fully ripe coffees. We also have a wet mill, or a micro mill, as some of you might know it, at the farm that ensures that as soon as we pick the coffee, it's processed right away. So here we have um, you know, the depulper, and I'm not sure how many of you have seen one, but basically that's how you separate the cherry or the pulp from the beans. Right? Then we go through a fermentation overnight, and uh, what that does is it allows the enzymes basically to um, break down the mucilage. And then the next day, you know, we wash the coffee. And then once it's washed, it'll go down to the patios. But that is basically the wash process for coffee. And it goes down the canal. You can see that it's very clean. And uh, it, we do some density sorting. So some of the less, like the floaters, I'm sure you, some of you have heard of that, float and uh, are separated. That's with water. Fermentation without water. Yes. Good point. Yeah. We also, as I mentioned, are now doing different processes. So that is also a whole learning curve, and it's a different training. Because what we, when we say red, so if you see here, the, two, the ones that are more like almost purple on the tree, those are the ones that we've found have worked better for natural and for honeys. They're much more sweeter. You pick it up and it's amazing. It's a fruit bomb in your mouth. So for, I'm not sure if everybody here is, I'm sure everybody here is familiar with honey, but what you see on the top right, that's a honey. It's drying on the, on the, on the dry beds and it, it's all, so it's been depulped. The um, pulp has been removed from the, from the coffee parchment. And on the bottom you have the natural, which is basically the whole fruit, just dries together in, and we use um, African beds, raised beds. 
we do all of that in our dry mill. So from the farm, all of the coffee goes down. It's about an hour, uh, about an hour from down the mountain to the dry mill, Beneficio Santa Lucila. And that is where we have the patios and the African beds. And we dry everything anywhere from seven to 21 days. It depends on the process that we've, that we've done, washed seven, eight days. Honey, more like 15 days, and natural, more like 21 days, okay? And if it's not sunny, then it might take even longer. We then let it rest for a minimum of one month. In fact, we're doing our naturals more about two months. And then um, we do all of the milling, the dry milling, which is removing the parchment from the bean and get it ready uh, to export right before it goes out on the container to ensure quality. We also have a cupping lab. So the cupping lab is in our dry mill, and we have a Q grader, our head roaster, um, a, a head cupping, copper, he's a Q grader, and we follow SCAP protocol. And we cup every single lot multiple times. So by the time it reaches the patio, you know, and it's dry, we start cupping it, and then all the way until it gets exported. We do also lot separation. So the way we process our coffee and the way we've laid out the farm is by varietal. So we do bac bacamara separate, you know, catura separate, VSRG separates and uh, we follow that separation all the way through the end. So our coffees can be traceable all the way to the farm, the date, the lot, you name it. <laughs> so that has worked well for us for coffee, but the other thing that I think is really important, and going back to ensuring that we get as much value for all of the work and effort involved, we start, started doing coffee charity. So from our natural pacamara, we, when we separate, the skin from the parchment, from the seeds, that is the pacamara that we use. And I brought some here, so some of you might be able to taste it tomorrow, hopefully. So that all works great. We do a lot of work, we put a lot of effort, you know, into making sure that the coffee grows, the plants are beautiful and everything. But coffee is not wine. Wine, you're able to grow the the, you know, in the vineyard, you process it, then you bottle it, and it goes and it's ready to be poured by a consumer or, you know, in the restaurants. Coffee doesn't work that way. So that's when all of you come along. Yeah. All of you, the co we do everything that we can to make sure that we produce the highest quality coffee. And then it comes to roasters, you know, who do a wonderful job, and thank you for using your artistry in making sure that the coffees are roasted perfectly. But then it also goes to the baristas, right? And making sure that when you brew it, you choose the right brewing system and everything. So it's very important to understand that we are interconnected. What we start at the farm, you guys finish it here. And we need to work together to ensure that the quality gets followed through all the way from seed to cup. So, so we have really focused on establishing direct relationships. Why? Because there is so much work involved. We partner up with um, roasters and buyers who share our passion for coffee, who value quality, who recognize the, a lot of the work involved and pay for it, and um, who realize that this is a long-term commitment. This is not a one-year you know, changing. It just takes too much work. So what is next? This is what we've done so far. What happens with the next generation? And that's another big challenge that we at the farms are facing. Because in the next generation, you know, a lot of them, there's no um, incentives because of the prices or the work involved. So a lot of the um, farmers work uh, sons and daughters are going somewhere else and choosing to do something else that is much more rewards their hard uh, work more. In our case, thankfully, this is my nephew, Danny. He has set up a roaster in Miami, and I'm very happy that he's now taking it full circle. You know, he's working with our coffee, and he's starting off right now. But to the right, you see my nephew, three years old, and we don't know what's gonna happen in 20 years when he's at an age, you know, really when uh, to take over the farms. Is he going to follow what my father, my grandfather, father, started, what we are doing now, will he continue it? We don't know. And that, I think, is one of the um, most significant challenges right now, because without farmers, there's no coffee. And without you know, farmers who really value and have the passion for coffee, there isn't the quality that all of you are looking for now. So I want to thank you 
you know, for listening to me and my story. But I want to just end with a couple of things. One size does not fit all. This is our story. This is what works for us. This is what we found to be the best way. Don't assume that there's different farmers and there's different models you know, that work for that particular farmer. Find out what their current situation is. But also, find out what their story is. There's a story behind every single coffee that you work with. What is that story? Who grew it? Where is it? Be open to learning, like you're all doing here. We're all doing here, learning. If you can go to Origin, wonderful. It's so rewarding to see people who have tasted your coffee and then bring it to you, roast it. Oh my god, every day, no matter how long I've been doing this, it's such an exciting time. So do that if you are in that possibility. Share knowledge. Bring back knowledge. Play around, take Chemexes, you know, Clevers, you know, Aeropress. We love to see that at Origin. Then the other thing is everybody in this room can make an impact. In every single day that you do, when you're serving that last cup, you know, to your consumer, you can share the story, you can continue the quality, you can just improve the overall coffee community. And then everyone needs to be rewarded, because if we don't work in a model where everyone, us at the farm, you guys here, gets rewarded and recognized for the job, you know, for the work, for the passion that we have in coffee, we're not going to grow as an industry. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Thank you. That was amazing. Now we have a time for a few questions. Anybody have questions? I have one, Sarah. Um, you said you worked hard on direct relationships. How do you start those? How does Good that point. Begin? Good. It's not easy. You know, I think one of the things that we realized a few years ago it was through Cup of Excellence. Uh, Cup of Excellence has been going on in Nicaragua for about 10 years, and uh, some of our direct relationships came from that. You know, um, basically, it's a great tool to expose uh, farmers to the international market, and also for roasters and buyers to expose them to individual mar uh, farmers. But also, I now share my time between Nicaragua and California, the US. So being that I'm there, I go to events like this all the time. I knock on a lot of doors and just meet people all the time and try to identify which, where's that fit. Because not a, similar to in, at the farm, one size does not fit all. Same at the roaster level, right? Everybody, not everybody can do or wants to do those direct relationships. So we try to look for that, for the ones that we have the same, um, we're thinking in the same terms. All right. Um, any more questions? When you do the uh, <clears throat> processing experiments, are those coffees already sold before you do a natural process or honey process? Yes. So yeah. that's how you justify the risk? Exactly. So doing natural, it's extremely risky. Same with honey. You basically can lose that whole crop. When I was going back to the ripeness level, it's not, uh, it's not a joke. You know, something that we experienced earlier this year is that we didn't have rains all throughout the harvest. And then it was actually fairly cold in the mountains this year. So all of the whole harvest was delayed by one month. So everything was delayed by one month. So every day we go to each of the different plots and figure out when we're going to be able to pick. You know, when is it ready for picking? And uh, then all of a sudden, we had a night rain. And the coffee that we thought that was already, OK, tomorrow we'll pick it, or I think it was like in three days later, all of a sudden, it had to be tomorrow. So in that situation, right, if you don't have enough people, you know, enough resources to go in there and pick everything, that would have been lost, because we were waiting for, to, in, to produce an order for natural coffee, right? So if that rain could have cost us that whole thing. But because we knew we had already a buyer, we were able to put all hands on. Yes. But we do, we've done quite a bit of 
experiments. It's fun, but risky. <laughs> Uh, what, what solution did you take to fight back Roya? Yeah. So Roya is something that has been affecting Nicaragua since the 1980s. Okay. We have, uh, my brother has a farm in the lower elevation and he's been um, dealing with it since the 19, you know, like for a long time. So um, thankfully the farm manager at Los Congos knew how to recognize it. The reason I'm bringing this up is because Roya, if you are able to recognize it, early on, you're able to treat it. If not, it's gone. I mean, a full healthy tree, it's, I was in tears when I went up three years ago and started to see what the effect was. So we manage it um, immediately. We are using some uh, fungicides that are systemic you know, to the, to, to the plant so that they boost the immune system of the plant naturally. And we also do lots of pruning. Everything is by hand. You know, so we do lots of pruning and making sure that, you know, if a tree has been hit, you know, and it's not going to come back, it's going to, we're going to, we prune it. We were also doing a lot of, um, we, we planted over 100,000 trees this year because older trees are more susceptible to diseases and roya. So what we're finding now is that, okay, we need to ensure that we have younger, stronger trees that can withstand you know, diseases. And it's not just Roya, right? It's, there's so many other diseases that we deal with. Great. Thank you so much.